What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today, we have a fantastic episode for you. Joining me across the screen is Dr. Stefan Van Vliet. Dr. Van Vliet, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to have you on. For the listeners who might not be already familiar with you and your work, could you give us a little bit of background about yourself? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm a human nutrition scientist and a metabolomics expert in uh, the Stedman uh, Center for Nutrition and Metabolism within the Duke University School of Medicine. Uh, from January 2022 20, onwards, I'll be taking a position at uh, Utah State University at the Center for Human Nutrition Studies, so really continuing my work there. Um, most of my work is really at the nexus of agriculture and human health. So what that means is that we, our research groups ask questions such as do production practices that uh, uh, are environmentally friendly or, or more sustainable. So production practices uh, that uh, improve soil health, water retention, plant biodiversity. What is their connection to human health? In other words, uh, do beneficial agricultural production practices potentially also have a trickle down effect to human health? And in that work, it's, it's a lot of systems types work where uh, we are working together with soil scientists, agricultural scientists, even economists and, and social scientists. And really my expertise on that in, in that entire linkage is uh, the human nutrition and the metabolomics piece. And what metabolomics does is we really take a deep dive into food sources because usually you only see a few nutrients appearing on food nutrition labels. So our food contains hundreds to thousands of uh, uh, metabolites, which is basically a fancy way of, uh, of denoting certain uh, nutrients as, such as amino acids, fatty acids, and, and polyphenols and other phytochemicals. So we look how production practices impacts the, these nutrients in food sources and how that impacts uh, human health. That's really the bread and butter of my work the last few years. Excellent. As you alluded to there, you're doing a lot of absolutely fascinating work in the nutrition field. And as we were discussing before we got this thing rolling, and hopefully I can put this uh, a little more eloquently this time around, there is this increasing interest in plant-based nutrition. And this is for good reason. You know, the average person d does not eat enough plants, but it's almost come to an extreme of sorts. Whereas it, it is more or less put forth that animal foods don't offer anything unique per se. So they might be a rich source of some particular vitamins and minerals and, and even be more bioavailable source of these nutrients compared to uh, another plant source. But at the end of the day, these foods provide things that could be considered uh, you know, negative towards human health, such as cholesterol and saturated fat. And, and ultimately, we could just consume more plants, a wider variety of plants to uh, obtain those nutrients and get more uh, health benefits in, in the process. So it, it's almost in a sense that, you know, if, if the average person could uh, develop a well formulated vegan diet, and it suited their food preferences, that that would be the optimal diet, not only for human health, but for the planet, you know, considering these increased concerns of the environment. So I have you here today because of all of the unique work that you're doing in the sense that you're providing information that animal foods do have unique benefits. They do contain certain metabolites that you can't find in plants. And these may be beneficial for human health as well. So I, I'm really excited to get into the weeds of your research, but I would like to hear from you. Perhaps you're in a, a slightly different evidence-based bubble as, as someone in academia conducting research. Are are the points I'm making, do they resonate with you? Or, or do you think perhaps I'm, I'm exaggerating the interest in plant-based diets a bit? Yeah, no, I think there, you are to an extent correct that there's an increased interest in plant-based diets. But on the other hand, I do think that the average research participant that I see in, uh, in, in my research lab and uh, 
uh, also just from going out into the community and things like that. I think most of the people are uh, looking to increase their plant foods to an extent. And I think that's probably one of the strongest levers we have to pull is uh, I would agree that increasing our fruits and vegetable intake and fiber intake, if you look at the standard American diet, then yeah, that is probably the most obvious lever we should be pulling and increasing diet quality. But that is a different discussion than uh, excluding animal foods, obviously. So those are those are two different things. And uh, so I do want to highlight that clearly, but I do think that uh, there's definitely an increase in plant-based uh, uh, diets. Uh, which is, I think, important for, for the reasons that I, that I mentioned with increasing our fruits and vegetable intake. But you are also right in the sense that uh, we should not uh, forget perhaps some of the unique uh, compounds or the, uh, the ability of animal sourced foods to strongly contribute to nutrient adequacy. And this is even in Western civilization where we see that there are uh, maybe 10 to 20 or even 30 percent, depending on uh, the nutrients that you look at, is that especially in a recent study that came out with uh, women of childbearing age, that there may be one or multiple nutrient deficiencies in about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the population. And you would maybe would not think of that in a Western civilization, uh, but this was in zinc and iron. So I definitely think it's important to, uh, to, to consider that. And of course, these foods are also provided by plant foods, but typically they're more bioavailable in animal source foods. And also what previous work has found is that if you consume, let's say beef with beans, both sources of iron, that you can actually help the uptake of the iron, the non-heme iron from the beans when you eat it in conjunction with beef, for instance. So the animal source foods can also aid in the uptake of, uh, of, of certain nutrients from the plant foods. And then on the other hand, if you look at the synergy, there's obviously a lot of concern with red meat, right? And some of the potentially carcinogenic compounds that are, that are formed like uh, heterocyclic amines and, and, and uh, uh, other compounds such as that. But uh, would you typically see that if you marinate your meat or lose a lot of spice and herbs or consume that as part of a uh, meal that is also rich in vegetables or in fruits for that matter, that you can sort of offset some of the, the formation of these, these uh, compounds. So you might get the good, the bioavailable nutrients from the animal source foods and some of the unique metabolites, which I'm sure we'll go into in a little bit, but you can offset that because you see that these potentially carcinogenic compounds, they're 80, 50 to 80% reduced when you marinate your meat or eat it, let's say with, uh, have your, your steak with uh, some, some broccoli or green beans or some other phytochemically rich uh, vegetable. So it is really the synergy between the two, uh, I think is, is, a, is a, main, uh, a main aspect to, to look at. But yes, at the same time, the plant-based meat alternative market, which we did some research into, into the plant-based meat alternatives, you definitely see that's growing rapidly. And there's a consumer interest to uh, maybe reduce some of the, the meat consumption in uh, Western civilization and, uh, and increase our plant foods. But we do have to be careful also. Another study that came out recently in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that uh, we've been decreasing intake of, of red meat specifically beef over the last 20 to 30 years, or even really starting in the 70s. And we now eat about 30 pounds less uh, per year. And uh, that's been also been tracking with a uh, reduction in iron and zinc also, in iron and zinc status. Now, oftentimes these are fortified also in cereals or, or other foods. Uh, so on paper, this should be prevented, right? But, but then if you go to a real world scenario, you do see sometimes that uh, the fortified foods are not able to completely maintain um, iron and zinc status. So I do think that uh, that is important to, uh, to highlight that, uh, yes, the fortification can help, but I don't think it's a, it's a silver bullet approach to, uh, to prevent nutrient deficiencies. You mentioned there a number of practical benefits of consuming animal foods for human health. Before we dive into some of uh, some specific studies of yours, I, I think it would be interesting to touch on the environmental impact and if if there are any positives whatsoever to uh, basically you know 
animal farming and, and producing these uh, animal based foods because, you know, as I alluded to in the beginning, and you'll ultimately, I think, run into this statement everywhere. It's just that, like, eat more plants, you know, save the planet, reduce your consumption of dairy products, red meat, et cetera. And almost in this absolute sense, right? It's, it's just, you know, eat more plants, save the planet. But, but is it a little more intricate than that? I mean, is there, is there any reason why, uh, you know, uh, the industry of animal foods could be productive in a sense for the planet? Yeah, I mean, as always, there's nuances, right? And it's a lot, it, it, it gets a lot more nuanced than those statements, obviously. I mean, of course, uh, the, the land use potential or, or the amount of land that it costs to, uh, to produce uh, red meat or, or beef is, is going to be higher than plant foods. But is that a reason to not do it? I, I'm not sure if that's the case, right? And um, the same with, of course, there's issues and we need to improve the sustainability of animal agriculture. Research that we've been doing is looking at uh, agroecological grazing practices that uh, uh, many farmers now are, are starting to do. So those are things such as uh, intensive rotational grazing or other adaptive management practices. So where you move around, move the animal around regularly, you prevent overgrazing, you make sure that uh, the, the, the fields remain the pasture remains productive. Uh, farmers, the farmers that we work with introduce great biodiversity because if you look into natural ecosystems, right, you don't, you never see a monoculture really of, uh, of plants or animals for that matter. Um, now in modern day farming practices, we have decoupled animal and plant farming, which is an issue because in, in natural ecosystems, you generally see animals and plants together. And then at the same time, also, um, when you look at, at these systems, we also have usually monocultures, both monocultures in animal farming and plant farming. So where, for instance, one farm would only focus on having beef and uh, maybe in a crop, we only do uh, corn or maybe do a corn and soybean rotation every year, but not really introduce great biodiversity, right? So. Some of the work that we're now also doing is with multi-cropping systems. So what happens if you grow multiple crops? Uh, this could be uh, things such as corn, wheat, or soy, or also fruits and vegetables and have vegetation strips. Does that improve the uh, nutrient density of these crop samples? And we're doing similar things also with animal farming. And is it multi-species grazing? Uh, where you maybe have chickens uh, that, that follow the cattle, uh, because obviously the cattle manure, right, it, uh, it produces, uh, it fertilizes the land, but also you get uh, dung beetles and, and other insects that the chickens then can capitalize on if they uh, are on the pasture after the, the cows are. Also grazing lamb and, and beef together, it produces more, more uh uh, pounds of meat per acre, right? So those are also things that are more agroecological or sometimes referred to as regenerative. So we are evaluating those practices and it's a whole team of scientists that we're working uh, on, on this with and, and soil scientists and uh, uh, livestock scientists. But typically what we see is indeed uh, it may be improvement in soil health there. It may also improve animal productivity. And what we're finding out now too is that these practices can also potentially improve the healthfulness of the, the animal foods, or at least concentrate some of these potentially beneficial uh, uh, plant compounds. Because when the animal is grazing biodiverse pasture, you see a lot of the uh, polyphenols, uh, carotenoids, uh, terpenes, things that you think of or you associate with plant foods, they actually appear in animal sourced foods too. So really where we're evaluating is, is linking the fields of environmental and, and, and human nutrition because uh, nowadays with diets, we almost cannot uh, decouple the, the two anymore. And there's an, even a call, a paper that came out recently uh, calling for, uh, and we need to take into account both environmental and uh, human nutrition metrics in the dietary guidelines for Americans. So we're really working on all that systems research, but, but to bring it all back is that, yes, we do see that uh, uh, different, ways of producing it will obviously have different uh, environmental impacts. And typically what we see is that the practices that have 
more beneficial environmental impacts for soil health and rudder retention. It improves the uh, health of the animal, it improves the health of the pasture, and that has a trickle down effect towards the nutrient density or some of these beneficial metabolites, uh, the plant compounds that are found in the animal source foods, which can have antioxidant and anti inflammatory effects both to the animal. And now we're evaluating that whether that has a beneficial effect uh, to us as well. So, as you can gather from my long winded answer, uh, it is not so simple as like a one sentence. Uh, uh, plants save the world or animal foods are bad or, or vice versa even. I mean, you can, you can find different uh, opinions on that. But sort of my idea on this is, is the following, is that yes, uh, we have in the past uh, not always managed uh, livestock agriculture properly. Then we can do two things. We can abolish it altogether or we can do a better job at it. The same thing is with crop agriculture, right? We are converting about a million acres a year in the US of uh, grasslands to croplands, which is something you don't often hear, but for the past 16 or 15 years, we've been doing a million acres a year, native grasslands into croplands at uh, a cost of wildlife and oftentimes moving into less productive lands. So the yield is not even the same. This was a, a study that came out in uh, one of the nature journals uh, recently as well. So then I'm thinking there, well, we also make mistakes in crop farming, right? In growing plant foods. Does that mean we shouldn't grow plant foods or should we do a better job at that? Because I consider it very likely that people will continue to consume both animal source foods and plant source foods. And really my research uh, program and, and that of my colleagues is focused on both animal and plant source foods. And how can we produce those more uh, uh, environmentally friendly and uh, also in a way that uh, could potentially benefit human health. So it's really the combination between the two. And yeah, one of my favorites uh, uh, is, is that we're working with farmers that have integrated crop livestock systems. I know that's not always possible everywhere, but uh, it's really where, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be an or question, right? It can be an and question, so. Excellent. Those are exactly the types of responses we look for on the muscle memoirs. I, I say in our episodes, we, we tend to pride ourselves on providing nuance to providing nuanced answers to questions that unfortunately tend to have an overly simplistic response, um, you know, and, and whether that be the, the confines of social media, right? Like there's a character limit on Twitter. So, so we, we lose details and, you know, uh, and, and we see these simplified responses and, and then we have audiences that just echo these without looking into it further. So I, I do really appreciate when it's like, uh, yes, but no, and, and here are a bunch of details to consider, but, but ultimately it's really complicated. So uh, I, I really do appreciate that breakdown you mentioned their nutrient density, which segues nicely into a recent publication of yours that I want to cover. And the title of this was a metabolomics comparison of plant-based meat and grass-fed meat indicates large nutritional differences despite comparable nutrition facts panel. And before we get into what this study actually achieved and the results. A, a fun term in here that I want you to define for the audience is uh, foodome. So, so what exactly are we referring to with, with that term? Yes, it's, it's, it's basically a combination of the words food and metabolome. So the metabolome is really uh, describing the metabolites. Metabolites are found in every organism. Um, and these are intermediates or end products of metabolism. Now, many of these intermediates or end products of metabolism would also be considered nutrients. These are things such as amino acids, fatty acids, uh, plant secondary metabolites, which are things such as uh, polyphenols, uh, terpenes, uh, carotenoids, uh, the cofferols, which are the precursors to many vitamins like vitamin A and vitamin E. So those are metabolites. Now, if we look at metabolites in food specifically, we call it the food metabolome. And uh, obviously in research, we always want to have uh, simplified and, and, and catchy sounding words. Um, so people have started to refer to it as the food dome. Uh, so that's really the, the type of word. But uh, 
yeah, the, the type of work that we're, we're doing is, is metabolomics and, and really studying a wide variety of, of nutrients and metabolites. And uh, we're really going beyond the nutrients that appear on Nutrition Facts Panel. So there's 13 nutrients that routinely appear on Nutrition Facts Panels. These are things such as protein, carbohydrates, fat, and then within that uh, fat and carbohydrates broken down to things like uh, saturated fat and the carbohydrates like sugar and fiber. And then we also have a handful of vitamins and minerals that routinely appear on Nutrition Facts Panels. Now, food sources in their natural state so the whole food matrix contains hundreds to thousands and even 10,000s of metabolites, especially when we start taking into account some of these uh, secondary metabolites that uh, are, are found in, uh, in, in plant source foods, but also as we found out recently in animal source foods, because when the animal grazes biodiverse pasture, you see these plant compounds also appearing in, uh, in animal source foods. Um, now, oftentimes, it gets way too complicated, right? Because you cannot put a thousand nutrients on a nutrition facts panel. So we do have to rely on, on simplification there. But as with many things, it may, may backfire a little bit in the sense that uh, what we were interested in studying is plant-based meat alternatives and other groups have done this in dairy alternatives too. Is that, okay, based on, on the nutrition facts panel, when a consumer sees the nutrition facts panel, and if you look at then at beef and a plant-based meat alternative, they may look very similar because the plant-based meat alternative uses isolated ingredients such as uh, soy protein isolate or pea protein isolate or concentrate, uh, isolated vitamins and minerals, isolated fat sources, and it looks more closely to the nutrition facts panels of meat. Now, in this study that you mentioned, we are interested in using metabolomics to really go beyond those nutrition facts panels and seeing what are all some of the other metabolites and nutrients in food sources, because we know the whole food matrix is more complex than the, the uh, handful of vitamins and minerals and protein that appear on nutrition facts panels. So what we found in that work was, is that when you go beyond the nutrition facts panels, we found a 90% difference in metabolite abundance. So it doesn't per se mean that they're 90% different, but there's a, uh, or, or that one, I should reframe that. It doesn't mean that one is 90% more nutrient dense than the other. We cannot determine that from that work. And it's, it's not even an apples and oranges comparison. It is literally a, a soy-based meat alternative versus a beef comparison. So they are as different as you would expect beef and soy uh, to be. If you make meat from a cow or you make meat from a soybean, you get very much different nutrients. And that's, that's really what we found. So there were about 50 to 60 metabolites that were only found. So about 25 of the metabolites that we uh, annotated or detected were only found in the plant-based meat alternative or in the beef and vice versa. Now these are nutrients and we can go into them, but these are things such as uh, anserine, creatine, uh, carnosine, other nutrients that we did not look at per se in our work, but others have also shown that taurine is an important nutrient. Uh, all of these, have certain antioxidant uh, components or neurocognitive benefits, such as anserine and then taurine, uh, also cysteamine, which is a main precursor to glutathione. Glutathione is the inter main intercellular antioxidant in the human body or also in the animal's body. So some of these nutrients were only found in the beef. Now, on the other hand, several uh, phytochemicals or, or, or uh, phenolic compounds such as the soy isoflavones, which at moderate amounts could have anti-inflammatory effects or could potentially uh, uh, have other uh, health benefits. And again, we need to study this more in humans because most of the health benefits that we understand are from uh, animal work. So in laboratory mice and rats, as well as in a Petri dish. So we definitely need to do more work on this in humans. But what, it, what we found was, is that they're really not comparable. So we cannot really say if one is healthier than another, but what we could conclude is that uh, grass-fed beef isn't a plant-based meat alternative and a plant-based meat alternative is not grass-fed beef. There are some nutritional overlap, but there's also a large nutritional difference when you go simply beyond the nutrition facts panels. And we felt that this was an interesting research question that we wanted to pursue because in part it's because the consumer does not always realize that, right? We as nutrition researchers, yes, 
there were differences. And sometimes I hear critiques on our work and say, duh, of course they're going to be different. Yes, but if you are, are a nutrition researcher, then maybe you would say that or, or someone with an interest in nutrition. But for the average consumer who is taking up a, a nutrition facts panel, it may not be entirely clear. And that is also what a, uh, a uh, previous, not by our group, but a, a, done by a different group, but what a questionnaire or a consumer survey indicated is that over half of the consumers when presented with the nutrition facts panel were thinking that these were uh, interchangeable and often found that uh, the plant-based meat alternative is healthier because it's made from plants. Now, we can say that from our work, what we can say is that they're different. So, and that was uh, uh, very much the, the main finding of our work. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, the average consumer there and most people, they're just going to be stuck in terms of what's on that label. And if they see similarities there, then that's probably all there is to it. Um, you know, I we have a very diverse audience here at the Muscle Memoirs, but I wouldn't be surprised if to, you know, a, a nice segment of the population, they, they would be surprised to hear within this uh, metabolomics comparison that there are these unique nutrients with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties that are uniquely found in meat, right? Like this, these are terms that just get thrown around and you always hear it in relation to plants. So, so that could be uh, some nice insight for those people. Absolutely, yeah. And those are things such as uh, uh, taurine and, and, and taurine, for instance, if we dig into that a little bit, taurine it plays a, is, a, is a non-essential amino acid or a conditioning essential amino acid, depending on the life stage that you look at, because uh, Definitely in earlier life stages, uh, taurine is very important, but taurine plays a main role in, in, in cellular growth too. And think of it as like the growth of the retina. So eye health is important for, for heart health. It, it plays a role in, in nearly any, every cell in our body. Uh, and, and low intakes have been associated with some uh, uh, increases in maybe uh, cardiovascular disease, loss of, uh, of, of eye health, and, and other things like that. And these, this is a unique compound, taurine, named after taurus, uh, which is a, right. uh, a cow, right? And, and anserine also is the name after uh, the Latin name for a duck, because it was first discovered in duck. Now, anserine is also a nutrient with the potential antioxidant effects and neurocognitive benefits that play a role in brain health. Um, Several randomized controlled trials that used isolated anserine and, and uh, in combination oftentimes with carnosine, which is another uh, amino acid or, uh, that, uh, or an amino acid derivative that plays a potential role in, uh, in, in brain health and uh, meaning that the brain uses a lot of these nutrients uh, for, 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 uh, to maintain our cognition over time as, as, we, as we age or when we grow a brain. So that's why typically you see the importance of these nutrients at a younger age or again at an older age, right? Because that's when we go through a lot of either developmental phases or we start to see a decline in some of the uh, dysfunction. So but what randomized controlled trials have shown is that these nutrients can potentially uh, impact uh, cognitive function. Now, we certainly need to learn a lot more about how these nutrients within specific foods, such as uh, animal source foods, impact uh, brain health, because we don't know that yet, and not well enough at least, but there is uh, especially uh, a good number of studies uh, using these isolated compounds in human randomized control trials, then also in animal studies and in petri dish studies that suggest that, okay, these are important for metabolism. So they may be non-essential in certain growth phase, especially during adulthood. So it means they're optional, but it doesn't mean they're not important. And I think that's important to note is that these nutrients can impact metabolism and can impact health. Um, and, and that's really what, uh, what we're studying and what our, what our interest is. And uh, at the same time, there's many unique compounds only found in plant foods. So it's really the combination of, of both, if you either exclude plant or animal foods, right? And uh, certainly within adulthood, I mean, you're, you're free to choose whatever you want, right? The diet. So if you feel you're doing really well on a plant exclusive diet, then, uh, uh, and, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's great, obviously. And some people 
maybe do well on that sort of an animal-based diet, especially if maybe they struggle from some autoimmune disorders and they benefit from at least for periods of time limiting some of their uh, plant foods and until they reintroduce them again. Um, where I think it's important that we do not per se take those experiences and then extrapolate of how global populations should eat. And I think that's where uh, maybe what you were referring to earlier when you said, talked about the plant-based uh, diets is that yes, increasing fiber, fruits, vegetables, increasing diet quality, absolutely great. I'm all for it, but we should also be careful in uh, thinking that uh, we can uh, completely replace animal source foods and that that has no ramifications because we clearly see that that uh, can have ramifications, especially in low to middle income countries where giving uh, children some access to some eggs a week or, or a piece of meat or some, some dairy greatly improves like school performance, improves nutrient adequacy, improves their zinc and iron status. And uh, fortification, which is common and on paper should work in a real world scenario, apparently does not always seem to pan out. And I really think that has to do with the whole food matrix is that typically these nutrients are found with hundreds to thousands of other nutrients, cofactors that maybe aid in the uptake of that and, and make sure that uh, uh, they're bioavailable and, and that their once they're in our body, that they can be metabolized properly because of having these cofactors present. And I think that's why I always prefer a food first approach. If you can get your nutrients from foods, that would always be preferred. And then of course, in, there may be times where you need supplements, but if you can get as much as possible from foods, I think that's an absolute uh, preferred approach. And we typically see that uh, also in, in our studies, but also in studies uh, uh, done by, by other groups and even in low to middle income countries, I think is a great example of to see, okay, if you can get these to whole foods, that's really when uh, you see uh, the further uh, health benefits. We will definitely wrap back around to a whole food first approach on the topic of uh, extrapolating to global nutrition and how animal products may be particularly beneficial uh, in certain parts of the world. This is also going to relate to the geography or terrain, right, in terms of what they're able to grow in terms of plants and how uh, in certain places the land may be better suited toward animals would that be correct and perhaps you could provide some more specific examples of this yeah no i agree and nothing gets my uh, blood boiling more than when i see some of the recommendations right like how uh, people let's say in northern latitudes like uh, the inuit or something like that there's uh, yeah. this funny uh, well it's not really funny i think it's kind of messed up but like the the, the food pyramid with telling that the Inuit should eat like whole grains and certain fruits and vegetables that are grown in like, you know, temperate climates that are grown around the equator. And that we recommend that to people in Northern latitudes, because that's how they need to be healthy, right? Like traditional cultures in maybe Norway uh, or, you know, Finland, Scandinavia, or even up in, uh, in Canada and Alaska. Yeah, that, that's, that's completely mind blowing to me. Obviously, we also need to consider the cultural aspects. Nothing more messed up than that, I think. Uh, sort of a yeah, that that approach. And um, but yeah, I think that's so important, right? Because you see it if you look at geographical. If you look at across across the world, really, right? It, typically, what you see is that there's varying degrees of animal and plant source food. So it's almost like uh, traditional cultures operate on a spectrum of omnivory and depending on seasonality they may have increased have had more animal foods they may have had more plant foods typically also uh, is that women tend to eat a little bit more plant foods than animal foods uh, compared to men just because of the foraging that they did so there definitely newer research would suggest that uh, maybe we overestimated the animal source food intake sometimes a little bit in some of the traditional cultures because it's been mostly been studied in men. Um, but what you typically do find is that there's omnivorous diets, including varying degrees of plant and animal foods, right? And because uh, even if you look at the Inuit that uh, where they have uh, mostly an animal-based diet, right? Like some of the, the which is now more controversial, but typically in the past, like hunting seal and, uh, and whale and other uh, 
uh, marine animals, as well as caribou and reindeer. Well, even they would grow to great lengths. It's been well documented to go to great lengths of uh, securing seasonal plant foods, such as berries and, and kelp and other uh, maybe uh, uh, is this a seaweed or even eat the stomach contents of the animal, right? Tripe. Uh, so I guess that's the, the northern version of sauerkraut or, uh, or, or kimchi for that matter. So what you typically see is that the combination of animal and plant source foods is what, uh, what people have been consuming. But also I think it's very important. And sometimes we forget that when we start to look at global diets, the cultural and social aspect of foods, right? Even if you look at the Mediterranean diet, and there's certainly not one Mediterranean diet, because if you look at the geographical locations, then uh, uh, across the border in, in the Pyrenees in, Fran in France, they may be totally different than across the Spanish border. And they're maybe only 50 miles apart, right? Whereas uh, uh, in there might actually be quite a bit of red meat consumed too, right? In, uh, in, uh, especially in Spain which is also one of the, the longest lived populations, um, probably because of the Mediterranean way, the Mediterranean lifestyle rather than just the Mediterranean diet. And we can get into that too, is that uh, a lot of other factors play a role in longevity, not just diet. So those are also important to consider when uh, in, in studies. Uh, but my point being here is that, yes, the cultural aspect of foods are also very important to, to, to note, I think, and, and to respect that. So. Global diets, yes, we live in a global society now, and it's great that we can get foods flown in from all across the world and are not as dependent on seasonality, but I do think we also have to uh, uh, be realistic and that adopting a one-size-fits-all pattern is not going to work very well. Uh, I, I doubt whether it has acceptability and I doubt whether, uh, yeah, that's a route that we, we want to take. Yeah, absolutely. And I really enjoy your point there on, you know, not only how diets differ around the world, but even even in the same spot, seasonally, diets can dramatically differ. And, and it seems like with, you know, the interest in, in hunter gatherer diets, uh, in particular, the Hadza, right, from all the work that uh, Herman Ponser is doing, it, it seems like depending on, you know, the, the story or the narrative you want to put forth, it's like, oh, did you know that hunter gatherers mostly like like this or they mostly ate like that and it's like or even we can look at paleolithic diets right and it's like oh they only they only ate these foods and then we have all these great researchers kind of bring to attention it's like well you know their diets varied based on the season and sometimes they ate more of this but it, it's it's a little more complicated and it's not just like oh see this is the optimal diet for human consumption the these healthy people from long ago they just ate like this it's like they didn't just eat like anything per se it was an omnivorous diet that kind of varied over time yeah i i think it's so important and i certainly don't want to make it sound like we should go back to like the, the caveman uh, diet or the paleo diet, right? We live in modern civilization and it has many benefits, but what we can take away is maybe some of the good and not some of the bad, because it obviously was also probably seasonal shortage of foods. And uh, uh, certainly we don't want to portray it too romantic. It's, it's great that uh, we have access to these foods, but uh, yeah, to your point though, is that there's also not one diet that per se provides health, right? Because it was also a previous metabolomic study that uh, found that uh, a Mediterranean diet, and I think it was like a pescatarian diet, a plant-based diet, what did they have in common? They were all rich in whole foods. And I think it was also a DASH diet. A DASH diet is an American Heart Association approved diet that uh, uh, to lower blood pressure, but short enough, it's rich in whole foods, uh, grains, uh, legumes, fruits, vegetables, as well as moderate amounts of unprocessed red meat. Uh, so think of it just like uh, beef or, or lamb or whatever red meat you would buy in the store. Uh, so that's usually what's referred to as unprocessed. It means that it's, it's definitely cooked, but uh, it's, it's just like your ground beef or your steak that you would buy. Now, when people consumed a whole foods rich diet, you can barely distinguish between the metabolites in their blood and their health profile. So when someone says, okay, we need the Mediterranean diet, well, or a Nordic diet, the short enough is that there's many whole food dietary options that uh, provide good health, whether it be a Nordic diet, a traditional Okinawan diet, a Mediterranean diet, a traditional American diet, traditional South American diet, you name it, right? They are all a 
probably a good path to health. And uh, we must learn. And what do they have in common? They're typically rich in whole foods, but they typically also can uh, contain moderate amounts of animal foods. And certainly there may be some individuals that can thrive well on uh, plant exclusive diets, especially with our modern food supply, right? Where we have plenty of access to uh, foods rarely limited by seasonality. Um, but at the same time, there's also many individuals who at least seem to report doing well or better on omnivorous foods, right? And, and, and eventually shift back to, uh, to an omnivorous diet, which is something you also quite often see. So, so I think that is so important to at least have, have sort of the, the dietary freedom uh, with, within that to uh, pick a diet that you can stick with. And of course, if it's a standard American diet, I would dis discourage it because apparently then rarely you find someone healthy on that. And usually it's just give it time before uh, someone gets unhealthy on that. But, but at least within sort of the, the whole food dietary options, I do think it's so important uh, for, uh, for freedom and uh, having people select a diet that they can stick with. So that's, I think, is what's most important. Let's expand on this whole food first approach and the value of the food matrix. Um, in particular, how this all relates to resistance training adaptations. A anytime I can get a segment in on resistance training adaptations, we're all for it here on the Muscle Memoirs. So you had a, a review paper looking at uh, different studies that basically uh, investigated, you know, the the potential unique value of the whole food matrix. So looking at things like skim milk versus whole fat milk, I think your group in particular did a study looking at egg whites compared to whole eggs. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So during my PhD, uh, like you, I'm also interested in, in resistance exercise and I still am a big hobby of mine is still lifting weights and I still go to the gym four days a week. So that, that will never change. And uh, that's really how the passion started uh, when I was younger, about 17 or 18. I got into lifting weights and I wanted to learn more about nutrition and that sort of led me down this path of, uh, of, of academia. Um, but yes, we, when I started my PhD, I noticed that most of what we knew on uh, protein and muscle protein synthesis and how to build muscle in response to food intake came actually from protein shakes. So this is a whey protein, soy protein, casein protein, right? But the ma majority of how we obtain protein, even with athletes, is through whole food sources, right? You might have one or two protein shakes a day, but the majority will come from whole food sources. Now, there was surprisingly little known about how whole food sources impact protein metabolism. So with my advisor, uh, Dr. Nicholas Burke, we first did a study on uh, milk and beef. And what we actually found was, and it was very interesting because the beef was digested and absorbed quicker than the milk. And so more amino acids became available in the first two hours. So the, the peak in amino acids in the blood of participants after performing an hour of resistance exercise, after eating beef was higher than the milk. Now, what was known at the time or what was the prevailing thought is that a higher uh, amino acid a level of amino acids in the blood will result in a higher muscle protein synthetic response. Now we found the opposite. With the skin with the milk in the first two hours despite being more slowly digested and absorbed lower amount of amino acids in the blood still gave a higher muscle anabolic response in the first two hours when we studied this over five hours it didn't matter both gave an equally high response we followed up with that up with a study on on whole eggs and egg whites we're still sort of you could say uh, not convinced that uh, it was the whole food matrix that was causing that in the milk, but milk contains many unique peptides uh, uh, and, and proteins that can impact uh, potentially metabolism. And, uh, but we were still not 100% convinced because the uh, prevailing thought at that time was is that amino acids, the amino acid availability after the workout, if you can get these amino acids in quicker into your blood, you're going to have a higher muscle protein synthetic response. We didn't find that with whole food sources. Then we did whole eggs and egg whites, match for protein. So three whole eggs, that's about 18 grams of protein, but also 15 grams of fat. Then we matched that to six egg whites, which is approximately 18 grams of protein, but no fat. And all the vitamins and minerals and all the other bioactive components, such as peptides, they're all found in the yolk. 
So we essentially gave sort of an isolated protein source versus whole eggs. But the unique part of that was is that the amino acid composition of the whole eggs and egg whites are nearly similar because obviously 50% of that yolk is the egg white. And the yolk is also very similar to an amino acid composition to the egg white. So what we found was is that much like you would expect, the fat in the whole eggs delayed the digestion and absorption of amino acids. And this was in young men after an acute bout of resistance exercise. So they did a bunch of leg presses, leg extensions, and uh, uh, really stimulate muscle protein synthesis in the leg, which is the muscle that we were biopsying. So we took a small piece of muscle there and looked at how quickly the proteins in that muscle were built. Now, what we found was is that the amino acids were more slowly digested and absorbed because of the fats in the whole eggs, right? In the, in the yolk compared to the egg whites. But over a five hour period, which is the meal period in which we studied that, so five hours after consumption, we found that the whole eggs gave a higher muscle anabolic response. So more muscle was built after eating the same amount of protein after whole eggs, which we attribute to, again, many of these unique compounds or the vitamins and minerals and bioactive uh, peptides in the egg yolk, which when I actually went back into the literature in the 60s or 70s, and this is also the golden rule of science. If you can think of it, there's a good chance someone else has studied it or thought of it before you did and studied it in some sort of way, at least, maybe not as sophisticated, but has definitely been looked at. And what several older studies found, especially in animal models, is that these cofactors, the vitamins and minerals and certain other peptides we figured out later, do play a role as cofactors in stimulating uh, protein synthesis. So, and there's been more work done after that and also from other groups. Uh, recently, there was also, a, I think it was a 12 week study or eight week study that replicated our whole egg and egg white study over the long term and found also that uh, the strength gains uh, were higher with the whole eggs and that are also a trend for more muscle mass. Um, but my point being here is that when you start to introduce whole foods, definitely the non-protein nutrients start to play a role and it definitely becomes a little more complex and that you can actually, and that was really cool to see, is that same amount of protein, but you still get a, a different response, meaning that protein isn't protein isn't protein. So, and this is also just tying it back to what we talked about earlier, is the idea of when a consumer picks up a nutrition facts panel and sees, oh, 18 grams of protein, 18 grams of protein, right? There's large differences potentially in the muscle anabolic response. And the same thing is, is a paper that came out recently about protein equivalence, which is how it's been uh, sat in the dietary guidelines for Americans, right? Like, okay, like two ounce protein equivalents. We look at two ounce protein equivalents of beef or, or peanut butter or, or beans. Well, what you see is that the beans and the peanut butter give a lower muscle anabolic response than, uh, than for instance, the animal source foods. Because, and, uh, so that's also important to note is that uh, uh, different protein sources may give different muscle anabolic responses, both within whole foods and, and if you start looking at a wide variety of whole food, animal and plant sources. Typically, if you get your protein from uh, plant sources, you just need more protein to uh, make uh, get a sim similar anabolic response, usually uh, one and a half to two times as much. Let me bring something up that I would imagine a, a savvy listener might contest here. And that is within the context of there being an anabolic advantage to say egg yolks, uh, whole eggs containing the yolk compared to egg whites, they might put forth, well, isn't that just, can't we just probably attribute that to uh, the whole eggs providing, yes, the same amount of protein, but because of the fats providing more overall calories. And, and that is what's generating this, this advantage. So uh, what would you respond to that? I would say, no, that is yeah. not correct. Uh, because it has been studied too. So if you take isolated protein, and this has been studied in the context of whey protein and casein protein, which are isolated dairy proteins. So let's say you have milk, you extract the protein from the milk and you extract the fat from the milk, and then you mix those together again, you combine those, you provide more calories right there. So, but what other authors have found, if you just ate the milk protein or the whey protein without the fat, you get a similar anabolic response as if you had the 
whey protein and added the isolated dairy fat to it. So if you take two individual components of the whole food matrix, extracted the protein and the fat and sort of combined those back together, which you wouldn't have a whole food matrix again, then you do not see that uh, uh, elevated anabolic response. So it wasn't simply calories and, and others have shown it too, that simply just adding calories in the forms of isolated carbohydrates or protein, right? Like let's say if you uh, have a protein shake and you add a bunch of glucose to it, like uh, uh, drink a Gatorade with it, you get more calories, but it doesn't per se increase your muscle protein synthetic response uh, there. So uh, um, we think our findings were uh, irrespective of, of the extra calories that, uh, that were provided. But, but certainly, of course, if you look at it in a bigger picture, in part of like an overall dietary pattern, multiple weeks of eating or a day of eating, then of course, calories do matter. We know that in a caloric deficit, it is harder to build muscle and, and you uh, see a, a reduced muscle protein synthetic response. But we had young men that came off after an overnight fast. They were very well fed by us the night before. So they were definitely not in a uh, caloric deficit and they were also not really having uh, nutrient deficiencies uh, after, after an overnight fast. So we were somewhat surprised that even then in sort of a healthy young man uh, that acutely would have that, uh, that response. But uh, yeah, I would say that's irrespective of, uh, of calories. Excellent. I find this whole topic to be so intriguing because as I'm sure you're well aware, to me, it seems within the, within the market for, for the average consumer, there's still this mysticism that surrounds whey protein, right? Like it, it's not just about the convenience of being able to bring some powder in a shaker cup to the gym. There, there's still this perception that like, oh, well, because it's uh, rapidly digested and absorbed and it has very high leucine and branched chain amino acid content, that it's just the, the peak protein source to consume to optimize resistance training adaptations but with all the work you're doing and, and this uh, great research on you know the food matrix and how consuming whole foods uh, perhaps in, in particular after your workout could be uh, you know more advantageous for your gains yeah absolutely and we also should not think of this as sort of like protein as in we think of it as the nutrient protein, but we really need to look at this in protein rich foods, right? We eat foods, not nutrients. And we eat these foods as part of complex dietary patterns. So now, and I think this is gonna keep growing in the next 10 to 20 years because some, even some of the big meat companies are rebranding themselves as protein companies. But we, protein rich foods provide more than just protein, right? They provide, usually come with uh, various vitamins and minerals. Some of these animal rich protein foods that we talked about contain things such as taurine, uh, carnosine, answerine, creatine, which is also something probably many listeners are very familiar with, especially those who are engaged in resistance exercise. So, uh, creatine also found uh, in meat uh, and fish, but not in plant source foods. On the other hand, plant rich proteins such as legumes, uh, right? And uh, so soy or, or, or lentils and things like that, they may contain higher amounts of other things such as manganese, folate, fiber, other things that can have potential benefits to the athlete, right? A healthy athlete is probably also a well-performing athlete or, or even as just uh, the lay individual, the person that goes to the gym such as me and, and you that, you know, just love to lift weights or, or exercise. There also, it's important to not really think of it as like, oh, I just need protein. You need to think of it as like your overall dietary uh, pattern and some of the other unique nutrients that uh, foods provide. So that's why I always get a little bit cringy when people look at this, like sort of like the nut nutritional reductionism, right? Dumbing down individual foods to like a single nutrient, like, oh, we need protein foods or something like, like those are talking about a very wide uh, heterogeneous category of foods as if they're hom uh, homogeneous more, so more similar simply because they provide protein, right? And that was also sort of what we found in our uh, 
comparison, our metabolomics comparison of the beef and the plant-based meal alternative, yeah, they contain similar amount of protein. And then based on the protein, you could say like, oh, they're protein equivalents. They're interchangeable because they got similar amounts of protein. Well, look at the other hundreds of nutrients that are found in there. And then you see that large differences appear. And many of these nutrients do play an important role in potentially uh, our health and potentially also uh, athletic performance, which we definitely know from, from creatine. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot get isolated creatine and add that to, uh, to it or isolated taurine. But I also must say is that those, then you have two. What about the other hundreds to thousands of nutrients that are found in food sources, right? You cannot supplement it all. And what we also see is that typically these isolated compounds are not as good as when you get them from, from whole foods in terms of like uh, uh, the health benefits or, or some of the uh, impacts on metabolism. So, and then I want to highlight too, is that we're also just scratching the surface of the complexity of whole food sources. So I don't want to act like here, like we have it figured out. This is the whole food matrix. This is what foods contain. We're scratching the tip of the iceberg using these metabolomics techniques. And I'm sure in 30, 40 years from now, we'll know a lot more. And like, just like we in academia and I look back at some of the research that's done in the 60s and 70s, which is great research, but it's almost looked as like, oh, look at these guys and girls with their primitive work. I'm sure in 50 years from now, other scientists will look back at my work or our work and think like, oh, whatever were these guys doing with their primitive research techniques, right? So, and we'll know much more. So I always, uh, that's really why I think that that food first approach is, is so important, but it is important to really look at uh, foods beyond just like to not dumb them down to single nutrients. And that's really where we, uh, we run into issue when we're just like, thinking of that, okay, beef contains protein, legumes contain protein, so we can just consume those, or they can consume zinc or iron, but it contains so many unique uh, compounds, and typically also, it doesn't even take into account the bioavailability of the two, right, whenever I see like a weird meme that uh, says, uh, well, broccoli is more protein dense than beef, I'm like, yeah, well, it's uh, you need a lot more calories to get that, and uh, the protein quality is also uh, reduced, and then, uh, comparing broccoli to beef or something is, uh, is, is not, uh, in fact, I would argue, maybe you want to consume both because you get unique uh, compounds of uh, both of them. And uh, uh, I think that's so important to, uh, to note also, and uh, hopefully uh, savvy consumers will pick up on this in, in the future. But uh, I am a little worried that uh, we will keep going down this reductionist path and uh, start thinking like uh, protein is protein is protein, zinc is zinc is zinc, iron is iron is iron without much regard to the food source where it comes from, whereas we should be paying attention to the food source where it comes from. Absolutely. I, I think that was such a great way to tie together many of the concepts that we discussed today. But Dr. Van Vliet, I'm very appreciative of your time. That's all I have for you today. For the listeners who want to learn more about you and, and support you, where can we point them toward? So, I try to stay active on social media, on Twitter. My handle is at Van Vliet PhD. So my last name followed by the letters PhD. Uh, if you just type in my name, uh, Stefan Van Vliet, and then uh, either put Duke behind it or Utah State University, you'll also find uh, me. Uh, also my Google Scholar profile, which is all of uh, my publications. And uh, uh, those will be good ways of, uh, of, of following I me mean, if people are interested in learning more about this work. And uh, all of our papers, I always try to pay for the open access fee. So I think it's so important that uh, research is uh, widely available to anyone who's interested in it and interested to the public. Uh, so we, we try to do that. And that's some of the issues in science is that uh, a lot of it ends up behind a paywall and then uh, only we can see it and half the time our university account uh, doesn't even have access to it. So then it's like, okay, this is, you don't want to be an abstract uh, uh, scientist either, right? Because uh, uh, you definitely need to read more than the abstract to get uh, the nuances of the study down. Um, so that's so important. So we always try to keep my, my work open access and uh, so that everyone can read it and uh, yeah. I'm always happy to engage uh, with folks if, uh, if they have any more questions. I'm, I'm always up for, uh, you know, or a respectful conversation. And I'm always interested in, in learning more because as a scientist, you tend to have a natural curiosity 
So I'm always interested in, in learning more from uh, from other people too, and considering other viewpoints. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's so important to keep an open mind. And uh, I'd love to connect uh, with uh, with people who are interested. Fantastic. And I'll be sure to link up those resources in the show notes, including uh, all of the discuss- all of the studies that we talked about today. But that does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone.